Good enough. We'll be looking at the church in Philadelphia this morning. How many of you remember the churches that we've looked at so far? Anybody? <laughs> it's it's not easy, I admit that. Uh, we're going to look at them for just a quick moment because it's been three weeks between when we looked at the last one and this morning. So we're going to just do a quick recap. The first one we looked at was Ephesus. And it was a church that the only thing that God had to say about it in a negative sense was that they'd lost their first lo or left their first love. Uh, it, actually, before I get too far into this, I want to just remind us that... Oh, come on in, Robert. Good morning. He got done early, so I started early. Okay. <laughs> uh, We're back into the churches again, Robert. Oh, okay. So, yeah, Revelation 3. Which one are we talking about this morning? Well, Philadelphia. Oh. But we're going to do a quick recap because I don't think too many of us can remember what all they were. I struggle with that, and if I'm struggling with it and going over it all week, I would suggest probably others are struggling with it too. Uh, it's been a little while since we looked at them, uh, but I I would encourage us to consider each of these different churches and look at them. Uh, where do we fit in? Now, it might be that we fit into more than one of them, but Ephesus was one that when God looked at it, he saw a church that lo lost it, left its first love. It was no longer vibrant as it should have been, but he had one thing to say to them and that's to repent you know, if, if they repented everything would be great they would get all sorts of blessings Smyrna a church that God didn't have anything bad to say at all about what a drastic change from the previous one uh, Smyrna was a, a church that was right in the heart of demonic activity and um all sorts of, of sinful activity that went on worshiping false gods and they stayed true to the course. Obviously, that's one that I would suggest I would like us to be. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know that we're fitting in quite to that category. I hope so, but you know, uh, we need to be honest with ourselves about it. Pergamos, the next church that we looked at was inundated with improper doctrine and full of sexual immorality. What a, what a tragic thing for God to have to say about a church. Something that he set up and helped to grow, caused to grow. And they let... Uh, false teachers come in and it did basically destroyed the church. They were on their last leg, but God said, repent. If you repent, you'll get, you'll be blessed. Now that, that was the command to that church. Uh, Thyatira, it was an active, active church. One that God had, God was able to say, I, I know your works that kind of thing. But he also said that they too listened to false prophets. They had a whole pile of improper doctrine as a result. They were sexually immoral and God gave them time to repent and they didn't do it. They were a church that was in trouble. Very in trouble. And then we looked at Sardis, the saddest one of them all, a dead church, a dead church, one that had life breathed into it and because of desiring to be, to fit into the society in which they found themselves, life had left them. 
what a what a tragedy but god did say there's just this little tinge of life and if you repent i'll fan the flames once again and you will grow every one of these that god had something bad to say about he had one command for them and that was to repent there are two churches that didn't have problems and he had something to say to them too hold on <laughs> yeah those are the two different commands that god gave to the the two the, to the seven churches that were in that area I'm going to suggest this morning that we fit in somewhere in these, somewhere. I, in my opinion, I'm not God, and so I can't, I'm not the one that has the right to say, in my opinion, we're not a dead church, thankfully. Uh, maybe God would look at it a little differently, I don't know. I, I have no way to really go by that uh, but I'm not sure that we're a church without fault either I, I I don't know where we fit in exactly um, the one we're looking at today is Philadelphia and again we're going to go with basically the same format as what we have been using with these seven churches. <clears throat> First off, we're going to determine who it is that is the speaker. Verse 7 says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy. Hmm. How do we determine who that is? I mean, we, we all have the Sunday school answer. It's God. Or in this particular case, it's Jesus. We have been taught that that's the way it is. Well, if I was to ask you on what do you base your belief, what would you say? Now, that's, that's a tough question. Uh, I, I believe it because my Sunday school teacher taught me that when I was a kid. I, I, I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. Mom and Dad taught me. Uh, I, you know, What do we base our belief that it, the one who is holy is being referred, that's being referred to here is Jesus? I've got only two verses out of a long list of verses that uh, express who it is. I, this is not enough to necessarily base a doctrine on, but I didn't want to spend all morning dealing with this one aspect of it. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8 says, The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who it was and is and is to come. Hey, that gives you a clue as to who it is that's holy. That's a, a, a starting point. Mark chapter 1. I hope I got all these references right. I... I and, I acknowledge readily that I don't always do that. And so if I come up with some that aren't right, I apologize in advance. Now, oh, okay. Uh, say, uh, now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, Let us alone. He was talking to Jesus. Uh, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy you? I know who you are. And then what does it say? The Holy One of God. Another clue as to who it is that is holy. These are two verses that you can develop and work through. Luke also mentions this particular instance and so you can add that in with it 
Um, but there's a lot of different references to Jesus being the one who is holy. And what did he say? The, thus, this is what, well, let, let's go back and read it. Um, these things says he who is holy. Okay, then it also says, and, and I'm, I've broken this apart specifically and purposefully, so I'm going to read it in that sense. These things says he who is true. What was Jesus' own claim to this regard? John 14, verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. His own claim was that he is the one that is truth. Again, put that with he who is holy, and who do we come up with? Jesus. It's a, it's a logical pro progression. Then it gets into one that's a little bit tougher. He who has the key of David. <clears throat> well, I, I'm not going to get too crazy with this, but Matthew 20, Matthew 21 Jesus was nearing the end of his time on this earth in this particular passage. And verse 9 says, uh, Then the multitudes who were before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, who were they looking for there? A Messiah. In all, for all practical purposes, what they wanted at that point for Jesus to be is a king. Okay, that was when he was get, heading into Jerusalem one last time. He was about to be taken captive and about to be hung on the cross. It was within just a couple of days of when all that was going to take place. And the people all around were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Why? Because David's line was a kingly line established by God. Jesus was in that line. You go into the first part of Matthew and you go into the first part of Luke and you'll see by the genealogies that no matter which way you slice it, he was of the kingly line. Okay. How did he have the key of David? Because he is king of kings. Absolutely the king of kings. Now, another interesting tidbit to this regard is in is in Daniel and if I could head the right direction in my Bible I will actually read it Daniel 6 talks about him only I could make a case that that's talking about Almighty God but Daniel 7 on the other hand is extremely explicit as to who who has the kingdom. Um, verses 13 and 14. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and, brought, and they brought him near before him. Who is that referring to? I would suggest to you that that's referring to Jesus. I mean, who else would fit that? Verse 13 is pretty clear as to who that is, but look what it says. Then to him was given dominion and glory and what? And a kingdom that all the people, the peoples, nations, 
and languages should ser serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. So who is it that is holy? It's Jesus. Who is it who is holy and true? It's Jesus. Who is it that is holy and true and has the key of David? Jesus. <laughs> now, the last thing that he said in that was he who opens and shuts. And no one opens or shuts beside him. If God shuts a door, it's shut. If he opens a door, it's open. Now, there are no specific references to this in Scripture. Okay, That's why I didn't put any verses down. Now, let me clarify that. There are examples of God opening and shutting doors rampant throughout the Bible. <laughs> that nobody could do anything about once that door was open. I, I, I think of Paul going into uh, Jerusalem when they said, don't go into Jerusalem. Come on, don't do it, Paul. You're, you're going you're gonna to die there. They tried to talk him out of it. God opened that door, and what happened? Nobody could shut it. I, there are examples just Littered through the scriptures. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, it, it, because of the massive number of them, and because I didn't want to get caught up dealing with that, I didn't put verses with this, as you can see. But there, I, I think we all can come up with examples of God doing just that. Well. Even in the Old Testament, who is that? Jesus. What do you mean? Jesus was born to start out the New Testament. No. <laughs> no, he only came to earth to start out the New Testament. He was before anything ever was. He is. <laughs> He's the one that created it all. We could go back and verify that. I, I, again, I don't want to take the time because there's too much said about the church in Philadelphia that I don't want to spend the time dealing with it. Just to let you know, this is another church that God didn't find fault with. This is the other church that God didn't find fault with. So we're going to get into it now. The commendation. I know your works. See? I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So in that, you see four different things that God says about them. I know your works, which tells us that they were an active church. They were doing what God said to do. You have a little strength. Why would he say good things about them, but they have a little strength? That was a kind of a puzzle at first, to me anyhow. You know, here a church is not given condemnation at all by Jesus. Not at all. But they only had a little strength. It told me something. They weren't relying on themselves to do what they were doing. They were relying on Christ. They were letting Christ work through them rather than doing it for their own glory or because of their own strength. I would suggest to you that that is exactly the kind of church we need to be. One with just a little bit of strength so we can't say, look what we did. But we can say, look what God is doing through this church. I know your works. You're doing stuff. You're not doing it for yourself. You're letting me work through you. And then 
will add to that, you've kept my word. What's he talking about there? I believe that if we could sum it up, it would be when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? What did he say? Worship on the Sabbath? Sacrifice animals? No. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love him with everything you've got. And then there's another one just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Doesn't say lust after him. We talked about this a lot a number of weeks back. Uh, it's been a little more than a year ago that we talked about this. That kind of love is the kind of love that says, I'll go the distance, do everything possible. I don't care if it costs me my life. I will do everything I can to tell you of the one who can save You've kept my word. This was a church that was working, relying on God to do work through them. Available to the call. And they kept the word and had not denied his name. Between you and God, and I'll say between me and God, I'm not talking to me up here. I mean, if I stood up here and talked to myself, people would think I was an idiot. <laughs> but between us, we'll put it that way, and God, in the quietness of our own heart, have we denied the faith? <laughs> oh, I hope that the answer is a vibrant no. But I wonder, sometimes, if we do, hide it. Kind of like Peter did. You're one of those Christians. Nah, not me. I know you are. You talk like one. I, I don't care. And let anger arise. Oh, I hope that that is not what we face but that we have not denied his name. The promise. Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. The promise. Your light will shine. Others will see. That Jesus loves. His church. Why? Because he was the one. That was actively working. Through these people. They were willing. They were doing the work. They had a little strength. Had to rely on him. Uh, others will see it. And what does it say here? I'm, I'm going to make even these people who are liars come and worship. You'll see it happen. He's promising them fruit for their labor. I have heard, actually heard, a pastor misuse this from the pulpit. Talking about how they would be blessed to such an extent that they would be worshipped. That's not at all what it's talking about. I could give you the name of the pastor and you'd go, no way. But it's reality. I, I listen to it with my own ears. I'm not here to smack anybody in the face. That's not my idea here. Use this right. <laughs> you will have fruit for your labor. Look at the context of it. It's an active church. You know, I've prayed that for us here 
a number of times that God would show us fruit for our labor. And from time to time, do we see that? Oh, I, I believe we do. Other times it seems like we work and we work and we work and we work and nothing happens. <laughs> but that's not because God's not at work. Not at all. It's because people are fighting against it. But the promise to these people, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they were Jews or, and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. What a, what a promise. You know, this is the one who's true talking this way. You won't find a lie. Well, what does that say? <laughs> that this is true. It cannot be another way. The commendation. Because you have kept, verse 10, because you have kept my command to pervert, to persevere, and I know that's stopping in the middle of a sentence, but that's the end of the commendation in that sentence. We'll pick up the whole thing in a minute. You've kept my command to persevere. Now, what was it that he kept telling these other churches? Repent and hold on. Persevere. Don't give up. These guys were doing it. Now we jump clear back to the start. He knew their works. He knew all about what was going on. He knew that he was working through them. Why wouldn't he know that they were persevering? There's something that goes along with this part of the commendation. There's a promise that goes with it as well. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those that dwell on the earth. That does not say that they will not be persecuted. <laughs> not at all. There's people who would say it does. Let me throw this out there. He'll take them out before he lets them get hurt. <laughs> He'll bring them home to him before he lets them get hurt. It was a church that was so doing what he wanted them to do that he had nothing but a protective father's heart toward them. Everybody else, you know, if the whole world, everybody else isn't doing it, they were. <laughs> and because of that, he was there to protect them. Was their life a bed of roses? I doubt it. Well, I'm pretty convinced that they were just average people who struggled with temptation, who did things they probably shouldn't have done or say things that they shouldn't have said. And they got to go back and make it right. But they were doing that. They were not superhumans. They were nothing particularly special as far as people go. But they did have a right relationship with Almighty God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what it was all about. You keep them from trial no matter what. Promise part 3, Revelation three eleven. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Don't worry. I got your back. 
I'm coming. You know what it reminds me of? Now, this is a poor example of it, but it kind of reminds me of the old Western movies. You got a whole pile of covered wagons that are under attack and they're getting beat down. And what happens in the old Western movies, not the newer ones so much, but here comes the cavalry and they come in and they save the day. Why would that remind me of this? Because he's he just got through promising them, I'm not going to let them do more than what they need to do you. I'm protecting you, and I'm coming quick. I'm coming quick. You'll hear a trumpet, and up over the hill I'll come and protect you from any danger you're in. The command, hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Again, I've heard people say that that means that you can lose your salvation. No. Blessings of salvation you can lose. If you live your life for yourself, not doing what God wants you to do, guess what? <laughs> There's not going to be much when you get to heaven that you're going to be able to put at Jesus' feet. The Bible tells us it's going to go up in flames. But he talks about us laying crowns at his feet. That's what it's about. Hold fast what you have that no one can take away your eternal blessing. Hmm. What is it that they had? The first four things we talked about. That's what they needed to hold on to. God wants to bless them. He wants to protect them. He wants to do all this good for them. There's only but one requirement for him, for them, and that's that they hold on and they persevere. Revelation 3.12, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and they shall go out no more. I will write, him, write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. Hmm. That's a promise. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he should go out no more. Where's that going to be? Heaven. There are people today who call themselves Christians and will say that Jesus died for their sins. They have a different meaning for it, but that's what they'll say. But they don't believe that they will be in that position. Well, guess what? <laughs> They're right. <laughs> but we're promised. And you go to Revelation 22. It tells you all about all the good that God has planned for us. Every bit of it. What heaven's really going to be like. Go to Matthew... 23, 24, 25. It'll tell you what God has in store for us here before we get there. But he's coming quick. And if we hold on, 
and let him be that protector, then we will not lose crowns because we will have done what he said to do. I want this to be our church. I want it to be my life. I want to do that. And then I get out there into a lost world and what happens? <laughs> it's hard. Let's be honest with ourselves. It's hard. How do we live that kind of a life? By total submission to the one who makes it all possible. And that's Jesus. If I could stop looking at me and keep my eyes focused on him. If I could stop looking at my circumstances and keep my eyes focused on him. If I could stop looking at myself in all that I'm doing and keep focused on him, I would not have trouble with it. <laughs> Nor would you. Write on him, verse 12 continues, I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven. And I will write on him my new name. He will forever give you an identification with him. He's not going to do that for everybody. Not at all. What's the matter? Uh, it's just tap the screen. Move, move it back and forth. So he has a little bit more of a command. Verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So I ask you this morning, spiritually speaking, do you got ears? <laughs> oh, I hope you do. There's but one way that can happen. And that's by becoming one of his children. Nowhere in this church is there condemnation. There isn't. All there is is promises and conditional promises based on commands and condemnation or commendation get the right word out God had nothing but good to say about this group of people nothing but good But we have to ask ourselves, why? They did what God said to do. Are you doing what God says, tells you to do? God opens doors and won't shut them. Nothing can shut them. God closes doors and nothing can open them. He'll guide you. Are you doing it? Are you walking that path? For the first time in the history of my teaching, we're getting done early. I've never done this before. Huh? Probably. <laughs> but let me ask this as we close. Where do you fit in? We've got but one church to look at. And again, it's one that has difficulties. This whole thing can on. It means the rapture, the promise of the rapture. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's a definitely a tribulation, rapture, affirmation. 
First Thessalonians tells us to comfort one another after talking about getting taken out of here. You know, there's going to be rough times, but we're going to take you out of here and comfort one another with these words. How could you comfort one another with these words if we aren't getting taken out of here first? You know, I, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, Robert. God's got the believers back if the believer is doing the work. So what do we got to do? Got to know, we got to get to the point where Jesus can say of us, I know your works, I know you have a little strength, I know you've kept my word, and you've not denied my name. Now let me ask this in a, in a generic sense, how hard is that? <laughs> I, I don't see it. I mean, we could look at it, we could go, oh, that's, that's not that bad. That's all we got to do? Okay, get out there and live it. Be real about it and get out there and live it. That's what he's called us to. When you became part of the body of Christ, that's what he called you to. Yeah, absolutely. Could we do it on our own? No. Not possible. But you're absolutely right. He said, I'm going to send you a helper. And that one's going to convict, convince, and to teach. <laughs> well, hey, we got everything we need. We just got to do it. <laughs> you know, I really hope that's the case, Robert. I really do. Every day... <laughs> now, it, that's an encouragement to me you know, to even hear somebody say that that's, that's great Doors are open right there. Well, could I suggest then that we take opportunities to pray for each other to that regard? That we would take the opportunities? You know, we don't need to be given. I've, I've heard for years people praying, give us more opportunities. God, no. Help us to take the ones we get. <laughs> you know, and then let's be the kind of people that are willing to do what he calls us to do and let him do the work through us that's what it's all about but we need to pray for one another and boy anytime you want you can pray for me and you won't be coming up short <laughs> I'll guarantee you I could use it uh, and for those that do I say thank you heartily from the bottom of my heart uh, enough said. Let's close with prayer. Lord, thank you for who you are, for being the one who is faithful and true, the one who sets up and controls all that we can do, for being the one who opens doors and closes doors and secures our way. Lord, help us to walk that path. Thank you for this time that we've had to look at this church and what a blessing it is to know that it's not hopeless. Help us to be this kind of church, Lord. I don't know if we are. I don't know what you would say about Happy Camp Bible Church, but Lord, help us to be this kind of church. If we aren't, help us to get there. If we are, help us to hold on. Lord, give us 
fruit for our labor that we might be encouraged and know that you are very active in work and then help us to remember to share that with one another but lord as we walk through this life i pray that you would help us to remember to pray for one another bringing us each before you for that strength that we need thank you that we don't go through this alone but you've given us all we need you truly are an awesome god and we thank you for that lord just help us to not walk away from this place and forget it but that we would remember that we would consider that we would meditate on your word day and night be with us lord because we can't do it on our own but we thank you for what you're going to do in each of our lives in your name amen <laughs>